was I was actually so I was quite late. I didn't apply actually um, for PhD positions in Cambridge because uh, you know it wasn't clear to me I would do well enough to get positions there. So I hadn't really? applied. And then it was so it was in the summer actually that I sort of asked about this. And then I ended up talking to Stephen quite quite shortly afterwards. I mean, it was clearly that was where my interests were going to lie. I wanted to do things which were in the sort of the fundamental physics of black holes. It was sort of, and it was clearly his sort of interest. And Stephen, of course, liked to have, you know, he liked to have students. He liked to have good students to work with him. It's interesting that you thought you would not do well enough. I'm considering that you graduated on top of your class in part three. Well, I think there was a there was a sort of message given that the people coming from the physics parts, the physics department, were not going to be as strong as the people coming from the math department. So oh, it was I like, hey, you know, you can come top of the physics tripos, but you know, the math is so much harder. Um, which, by the way, was probably quite helpful because it encouraged me to, you know, work hard um, and make sure that I came top of the math tripos as well as the physics tripos. But I think that that was that was the you know the reasoning I had. Right, right, right. So then you, of course, I mean, continue to work uh, with Stephen and you work on something called M-theory that we will discuss a bit more on. But I don't think that was clear at the beginning uh, that you were going to work on M-theory. So how how did, uh, at so, what stage did yeah, you so, figure out so, the research topic? So Stephen, I think with all his students, sort of encouraged them to, to pursue research topics that he was interested in. They were topical. They were things he wanted to know about. It's not an accident that Stephen's students went into many different branches of um, theoretical physics, you know, gravity, uh, cosmology, and so on, because it was often reflecting his interest at particular stages in, in his career. So in this particular period, Stephen was extremely interested in the results that were coming from string theory. So in particular, he this is the period in which um, D-brains had been discovered by Joe Polchinski, and people were starting to build D-brain models of black holes. And so he saw this as, you know, string theory could potentially explain the quantum properties of black holes that he had been trying to, you know, uncover for 20 years. So he really wanted to know more about this and therefore saw this, I think, as an ideal thing for a student to work on. So he, you know, he suggested he had in mind actually a specific problem, which was linked to something that Andy Stromager, um, so Andy Stromager at the time was in Santa Barbara, so a colleague of Joe Polchinski's at Santa Barbara, you know, Andy had, you know, was very much following what Joe had been doing with D-brains. So it was linked to something Andy had been doing, but it kind of rapidly morphed into more general than that. It was really understanding the new things, new um, physics of, um, that you could say about black holes from sort of string constructions of black holes. So it, it sort of shaped in that direction, I think, quite, quite fast. But of course, quite challenging for Stephen because it wasn't an area he'd been particularly working in himself. He'd been following very much, but you know he had not actually been working in it. So there was quite a lot of, you know, reading to do of all the background literature, and there were also explosions of papers coming out because, of course, as soon as as soon as as soon as somebody makes a sort of breakthrough like D brains, people realise, aha, that has all kinds of other consequences, and there were many many papers coming out. Um, and, and string theory, of course, is uh, quite I mean advanced topic. I mean, it's it's difficult, especially learning about superstring theory. I, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, you you didn't take courses or anything on this. I mean, nowadays, I mean, you can take courses on that. But th this was brand new for you when you started to work on this. Uh, well, there, there was no, there was string theory. There was a string theory course in Cambridge because oh. Mike Green was in Cambridge, and so there was there was a, a string theory course. And of course, Mike was around and his students were around. So, you know, if you had specific questions about any part of, you know, the Green Schwartz Witten textbooks, you could, you know, go to Mike Green and his group. Um, but inevitably, one short course in string theory is, is, is just an introduction, right? It's, 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 it's the tip of the iceberg. And so you definitely do actually have to go and, and study a great deal on top of that. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. indeed, I, you know, I, through, through various periods, you know, I worked through, you know, the Green Schwartz Witten textbooks. And then later when they came out, there were the textbooks, the well-known textbooks of Polchinski. You know, that's what you have to do to kind of get the background in string right, theory. Right, right. Yeah, I, I actually have that book here. I'm reading a few chapters for reading group. Uh, but so as you describe in, in a blog article and have mentioned, I mean, so Stephen would not uh, give you quote unquote safe projects that the supervisor might give a PhD student to sort of get the soft start uh, into uh, becoming a researcher and know hand-holding, so to speak, 
so that so there would be like high risk, high reward on the projects that uh, you would work That's on right. with Stephen. Could you speak a little bit more to this and maybe give yeah, some so, examples? So, on so some of the things that Stephen was interested in, um, again, it was all around the, the, the questions of um, the quantum physics of black holes. So it was really looking at features of the, the specific deep brain constructions. He was also quite interested in in brains wrapping cycles in Kalawa Yells and how those could potentially be black holes. The point was that they were cutting edge questions that he was interested in. And by the very nature, if you're really pushing something which is cutting edge, it's not going to be something which is incremental and you necessarily know what to do at the next stage. And particularly because he was bringing a lot of expertise of his own, but not necessarily the expertise in string theory. So, you know, there were some things where he wouldn't necessarily know, can you compute this? Can you compute that? Um, but in some sense, it makes it, this is what makes it more interesting, right? Because, you know, you're really working on something which is, um, you know, potentially sort of um, groundbreaking, but frustrating them because you're not being laid out where well, you've got to do this, that, the next stage. Um, so, so quite difficult from that perspective. Yeah, hard to streamline a project when it's uh, in that arena. If I remember it correctly, uh, you had to read all the papers Witten had published during a year at the beginning yeah, of your so that, that was Yeah, so that was a starting thing. So this was a very, I mean, even by Ed Witten's standard, it was a particularly prolific year. So this was the, the period of, of string dualities and, and so on. And so, you know, there was a suggestion of sort of, you know, reading and understanding and getting at least the key ideas of these papers. You kind of had to, to actually understand what was being done by, by the string theory, string theory community. And of course, one of the best ways to actually really make sure you understand things is to explain them to others, right? So, so actually being asked, you know, being sent away to read specific things and see how that might be applicable to what we were trying to do. So having to explain it to Stephen and really make sure that you kind of crystallized and made clear what you understood and what you didn't. Um, again, quite challenging, but also quite, quite developmental to actually, to, to really be forced to... Um, process what you've read, really absorb it, process it in a way that you were actually confident to explain it to somebody else. And uh, Witten's papers in particular are not famous to being extremely easy to read either? Well, and, they, aren't, they aren't easy to read, but they're also inc incredibly logical, right? So, so, so it's more that he, you, know, you, you have to think quite carefully about, say, each paragraph, because there's an awful lot below each paragraph, but it is very, very logical. So from that perspective, it's, it's I, I didn't find them so hard to read. It's more that you had to sort of, you know, think a lot as you as you were going through it. And, you know, maybe you had to pause and go back and look at references and go back and look at background material and so on. Right, right, right. So they were very dense in that sense. They're very yeah, dense in yeah. that sense, yeah. So, so, so was this a way Stephen learned new projects uh, or, or new topics? He would have, uh, I mean, PhD students, for example, sort of explaining to him the new... Well, I think I think in, in yes, theory. absolutely. I mean, of course, he would also be reading, and you know, he'd be listening to talks, and he would take his own conclusions. So it's it's definitely not a one way flow. Um, and of course, in many many areas, you know, he he was obviously somebody people know him for, you know, Hawking radiation. But of course, he pioneered since many aspects of quantum field theory and curved space time and calculations in quantum field theory and curved space time. He'd worked in cosmology. He'd worked in many different areas. Um, very early in his career, of course, he he you know he did the the um, singularity theorems with with Roger Penrose. He had very deep understanding of analysis in general relativity, mathematical relativity. So you know, of course, enormous levels of insight. So when you were sort of discussing something with him, he would you know immediately be sort of saying, oh well, it's like this or like that, and then you'd go and look things up and realize absolutely, although these two areas of the literature were perhaps sort of running in parallel, he was correct that there were sort of connections between them. Right. Did you work independently or did you have other collaborators during your PhD? So um, Stephen had a number of PhD students and, and to a large extent, they did work on different projects um, to each other. Um, but of course, people discussed with each other. So, you know, to, to a large extent, it was, you know, me collaborating with him. I think one project, there, there was another PhD student involved. But of course, in the group as a whole, there would have been a lot of discussions about what people were doing. 
there was a culture of sort of Friday seminars where Stephen was paying for lunch to encourage all the PhD students to come along. It was usually each week a PhD student presenting. And that was, again, very much culturally about making sure that the students were sort of talking to each other, presenting their work, learning from each other. Um, so in that sense, you know, we were very much aware of many different things that were actually happening in actually many different areas of, of theoretical physics as well, because it's a very broad group. Um, so I, I didn't realize, I think, until quite a lot later that it was unusual for somebody who was working in my field to know as much about cosmology. But I kind of grew up with it because the group also did cosmology. Um, so these days they work very much on, you know, they've worked on Planck mission, they're working on the dark energy survey and so on and so forth. But I, I kind of grew up with them, you know, working on aspects of cosmology, sort of looking at predictions of cosmic strings, of inflation, of you know, correlation functions and so on, in a way that probably if I'd been in a you know group that just did string theory and quantum field theory, I wouldn't have had that background in cosmology. And similarly, in classical gravity, we had as, you know, parts of the group that did numerical relativity, mathematical relativity. And so, again, I always had that going on in the, in the background. I had some awareness of what was happening in those fields, which is, again, I think, unusual. Um, and it's not, it's not just down to Stephen, but in some sense, it, it's partly down to Stephen that he had those diverse interests. So the group that had grown up around him went off into so many different directions. Um, but he liked to bring people together in these sort of, you know, these Friday meetings so that people were actually kind of talking to each other and listening right, to each other. Right, right. Could, could you actually get the help from Stephen, say if you like wanted to get some detailed help regarding our calculation or was it more like in a broad sense? So you, you definitely could get some somehow. I mean, of course, communication was never to be quite slow. Um, when it came to, to areas where he had computed in the past, say quantum field theory and curved space times or, or aspects of, you know, relativity, you know, solving gravity equations, he, he, you know, he had immense background technical knowledge and you, you could get help. Um, if it came to a question like computing, you know, one loop amplitude and string theory that he'd never done, mm -hmm. no, you couldn't get help from him. But that's in a, in a sense a, a, a lesson because, you know, it, as a researcher, you should kind of learn to identify who's got the expertise and go and ask the right person. No, no single person knows everything, right? right so right, right. the important thing to do is to kind of go and identify who, who you should ask to get help. Um, and and one more example on this, there was some mathematical theorem that you wanted to generalize to higher dimensions. I think it was some index theorems. Um, yes. That was yes. also something that Stephen wanted you to do, but turned out to be a very difficult task after having spoken to yes. I mean, the very founders of this theorem. Yeah, so so this, again, so, so you know, Stephen's interests, you know, the, they were always sort of set in the context of the time. So he, at that time, was particularly interested in contributions to the gravitation entropy that were not associated with um, horizons, which are of co-dimension two, so two dimensions less than the dimension of the space time. He was interested in contributions which were from things of lower dimension. Um, and you could get extra contributions to the gravitational entropy. Um, so in some sense, they're a little bit esoteric because typically these kinds of contributions are also associated with unphysical behavior like closed time like curves. But nevertheless, conceptually, he was interested in them. Um, this sort of, you know, turns out to be mathematically linked to um, questions which Michael Atiyah and his collaborators uh, really analyzed very much in the 1960s. So it's sort of, you know, really linked to the behavior, what happens when you have a fixed point set of a, of a circle action and the, the kind of the, the, the geometric properties of that fixed point set. And so, you know, the, the, there are certain very explicit results for this, which are known in, you know, four dimensions. There are sort of certain generalizations which go through to six dimensions, but to, you know, in general, to get it to higher dimensions is, is, is really non-trivial. And it was, you know, something which was a sort of, to be done on the side, on the way to sort of the main goal for Stephen. Um, whereas perhaps would be a quite interesting piece of mathematics in its, in its own right. So I remember at some stage sitting there in the mathematics library. Um, so it no longer exists. The whole of the mathematics library in Cambridge has now moved out to um, the, the site of, um, you know, the, the, the faculty of maths on the edge of the city. But at the time, it was a sort of a beautiful old fashioned library in the center of the city, specifically for mathematics. And I remember sitting there going through, 
Atiyah's papers from the 1960s. And he had, a, I mean, there's a whole chain of papers on index theories, like it's one volume after another, and actually trying to sort of work out the results that were needed, got partial results, um, which I was quite pleased about, but, you know, Stephen would have liked to have gotten full results. Have, and then I had some conversation with Michael Atiyah at some stage, and he was always, he was already quite impressed that I had partial results. So it was, it was quite good to know. Right, right. So a bit of a broader question. So what were some of Hawking's best traits as a physicist and a person, according to you, having worked with him? So I think I think determination, actually. So always, I mean, as a physicist and, and also as a person, but, but as a physicist, it's that determination to keep going, right? And so it's a hard problem and to just keep tackling it from, from many different directions. Um, and again, as a physicist, there's also... Uh, very much um, this openness to, to learn new ideas, actually. So um, although many, some people might say, well, you know, Stephen pushed the question, you know, he was always interested in black hole information loss, that was his thing. But actually he was, if you, if you look at what he did over the course of his entire career, he was actually always reaching out into new domains and trying to sort of find out about new ideas and take those on board, which, Particularly given, you know, his um, his health condition is remarkable because most of us in, in theoretical physics, we rely on being able to sit with a paper and sit with a pen and paper and scribble things and scribble calculations as we try and understand it. And Stephen, of course, couldn't do it because he couldn't pick up a pen and scribble with it. He, everything he did, as he was absorbing many new ideas um, and taking, you know, taking them to new new kinds of directions. Hmm. And what were some of the most meaningful things that he learned you as a person? I mean, that he taught you as a person that you had sort of adapted already now? So I think I think one of the things which is maybe not appreciated, but I've, I've already sort of touched on, is um, the way that Stephen ran a research group. So his immediate research group was his PhD students. And then there's this wider research group, which was the whole, as, as it was, the whole of the DR group in Cambridge. And this sense that he was actually bringing people together to talk to each other and very much, you know, keeping an eye on them. He was, you know, you know, really, in a sense, trying to nurture them. Um, this wasn't necessarily what uh, senior academics were doing, let alone people who were as busy as him. Right. So that sense of actually the group being um, more than its parts, in a sense of bringing people together, I think, is, is something something I would say that um, I took I took from him. And something perhaps not widely appreciated because in some sense, people take this for granted until they realize that actually this is not what happens in, in many places. 